Hey, Jess. Oh, I'm definitely muted still. <laughs> you think by now I'd remember to do that. <laughs> How are you? I like your garden. It's growing. Oh, yeah. Flourishing. My, my apartment jungle over here. <laughs> it's amazing. It's crazy. It, I think it just loves the South. All the plants love it. Yeah. <laughs> Fine and warm. Like that the plant secret. right there used to be these tiny little like squirts of green, like very, very small, very sad. And within about a week and a half of being down here, they flourish. That's awesome. Yeah, it's crazy. How have you been? Good. What up gang? How you doing? Hello. Yeah. Hey. Wow. Holy cow. Most importantly, we got Keywen and Carmen on. Excellent, excellent. I'm here. Are people officially, fellows officially counting days? Yeah. It's not quite, no, it's not quite 30. I, I think you're not allowed to until it's under 30. <laughs> that's weird, right? It's the last um, training <laughs> after a decade plus or whatever it is. All right. We're not counting. All right, not yet. Well, I guess <laughs> not till it's under 30, then you're allowed to. Guys. Hi, Carmen. Hi, Carmen. I just got off the Peloton, so if my hair looks wonderful, oh, that's... Uh... I love it. <laughs> no, it's good. It's actually good for everyone to know that, you know, there's other stuff outside of um, outside of doing surgery or being chair of surgery. <laughs> Which ride was it? It's uh, Matt Wilpers Power Zone, 30 minutes. Ooh, nice. <laughs> they don't talk that talk, so I don't know all, like, who the debaters <laughs> are. And do you guys measure output like you know is it by calories or joules or what's the joules i don't joules. know i don't really i i'm not that scientific i it's so you i mean what's how do you measure that you did a good workout like what's the it, it's by this well your heart well, rate, your heart rate, heart rate. Okay. and okay. is that like an echo or something and by the power uh, is there revolutions rpms okay cool RPMs. see i don't know i don't do peloton i do i have an elliptical and i run and so i don't use the metrics yeah versus the resistance basically and and they tell you that so and then is it live or is it a tape thing or how do you like you can do both okay cool okay. excellent i mean it's like really the the fitness revolution of and it's like saved so many people during the during the pandemic know some people that own the peloton but they don't ever get on it so yeah. yeah, well, that was like the classic thing, right? Um, all yeah. these things, right? Stationary bike and um, elliptical and all these things become expensive coat hangers. Cool. All right, Libby Grubbs is here. So we got our faculty and then we'll see how many um, different uh, fellows hop on. For the people who just jumped on, thank you. And uh, welcome to the, the final web ESU webinar of the year. And 
for those that jumped on, we were talking about whether it's time, you're not allowed to start counting days until it's under 30 till you finish. So you're getting close, but you're not quite allowed to. Let's Hi, see. Kim. Yeah, so I don't know how many people are um, expected. Let's Hello, see. Dr. Solzano, how are you? How are you? Living the dream down here in Birmingham. Living the dream. <laughs> Um, well, it's 402, let's just kind of get started. I mean, this is a very informal session. Let me share screen and then uh, we can kind of get going. Uh, let's see. Um, all right, let me expand my um, fellow's grid here so I can see. All right, cool. So um, welcome. So this is the last ESU webinar of the year and it's definitely the most informal. I guess they're all, they've all been a little bit informal, but this is really just to kind of get you prepared for the next steps. And it's um, really um, a pretty, uh, it's case-based and it's, you know, pretty quick hit, no disclosures, uh, pretty quick hits. These are all just different kinds of scenarios. Some of them more practical kind of clinical things, some of them more kind of interpersonal slash administrative and all intended to kind of just get you in the mindset. And for the faculties, and I wanna welcome our faculty, Drs. Carmen Solozano, uh, Tracy Wang and Libby Grubbs, whom you all know from ESU. Uh, who have kindly agreed to participate in this. Um, for the, fa uh, the faculty, I want you to put yourself in your first year or second year out of practice, out of fellowship or out of training. And you're, you're the junior person. So you are not the senior person. So when you're answering this, I want you to kind of empathize and put yourself in that uh, kind of early career mindset. And that's really the purpose of this. And this is also really meant to be very interactive. So I want to leave plenty of room and space for you all, meaning the fellows, to chime in with either experiences that you've seen during fellowship or during the rest of your training um, or questions, thoughts, ideas, that type of thing. We want this to be very interactive. Um, and again, pretty informal. These are pretty quick hits. Some of them are a little kind of silly or weird. I'm just meaning to kind of just cover some of the different bases of things that may not have been covered during previous ESU webinars. And as always, just feel free to chime in and uh, you know shut me up or uh, ask questions to all the uh, faculty. And then I um, have trouble sharing on my laptop and monitoring the chat. Um, but, you know, uh, Tracy, Libby, and Carmen, if you want to keep an eye out on the chat for different comments from people. And let's just get started. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, first case. All right. And I have like goofy um, titles for each one because that's fun. All right. So um, uh, let's start, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll bring out to the panel. So you're doing a substantial goiter, doing it through a cervical approach like you've done a million, million times and you start to sweep from the mediastinum and all of a sudden there's a big gush of purple blood. Uh, so that's your scenario. And remember, you're just starting. You're not the super world expert that you are now. Uh, Libby, your mic is off. So let's start with you. Uh, oof, okay. So here is, um, if I, if I am starting out and I am doing a substernal goiter, um, I, I will do actually what I do to this day because I've learned a lot. And what I do now is if I have a substernal goiter that I think that there is going to be any chance of having some intrathoracic, um, issues with, I, I tell you, I, I get my thoracic colleagues involved up front. And by that, I don't mean that they have to be in every case. Um, but I usually will plan this on a day that I know that there's someone um, available because I, by the time I could do a, a sternotomy, it, it just, it, 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 it's not, it's not great in my hands. I'm really glad Barb Miller's not on this phone because she would bully me about my uh, inability to do a very quick sternotomy. Um, I could never do a sternotomy when I was a resident either. I have no upper body strength, uh, but uh, so any of oversharing, but anyway, so what I would tell you is um, that, that if you if you if there is an area where you could get in significant bleeding and you need help, don't feel bad about planning your surgery around that. Um, and by that I mean go ahead. I, I don't like to have unplanned things. I I will err on the side of of having colleagues available um, to come help. Um, anyway, that's that's my thought behind it. All right, uh, cool. So be prepared and have friends around. Uh, Carmen, uh, your thoughts? Again, your, your early career and uh, you get into bleeding uh, during one of these kinds of cases. Uh, I agree with Libby. I, um, I would 
kind of load the boat, uh, if you will, with folks that can help me out. <clears throat> my, in fact, my early practice, I was in Miami where we saw a significant number of goiters uh, coming from the Caribbean. Um, so in such a case, I would, wouldn't be shy if I expect a substrong goiter in getting the proper imaging, the proper folks around, usually the thoracic surgeons I know who's on call or I have told them to be on standby in the scenario that you're giving, I would have, uh, I would have even the smallest substrong component that you would laugh at me. I prep the chest and I tell everybody, well, I'm prepping the chest because it whirls worse evils away from this case. So most of the time, the majority of these will come from uh, from the neck and the scenario you're giving is a sudden gush of purple blood. Well, what could that mean? <laughs> you popped the goiter uh, and really is the cystic component of it, or you ripped the middle thyroid vein, or you ripped a larger vein, um, at which point you could put your finger and put pressure and call your thoracic surgeon. But hopefully you did not get to that point because you're doing the movements um, in a uh, sequential fashion. Um, those are kind of my thoughts. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, Tracy, uh, yeah, so I mean, you've loaded the boat, but let's say, you know, uh, thoracic is not around, or they're on their way or they're in another room or whatever like that. In the immediate setting, uh, have you been in the situation and what would you, uh, what would you plan to do? Have I been in the situation? Um, <laughs> actually, so um, it was, I think, maybe a year and a half into it when I was looking for a really deep para and I got into this situation. Um, and I think also D Doug had just started his chair, so I was, didn't, I was really petrified of having to call him and have him think I was terrible because he'd been here for like three months and I was like, uh-oh. No, but um, so, I mean, I think I agree with everything Libby and Carmen have said. I think, you know, it could be anything, if you really think it's coming from a large vein that you're not gonna be able to get control of, you know, either if you can see what it is and just stopping it in the interim, right? Get a debakey, put, put your finger on it, whatever is gonna stop it until someone can come help you. And it can be anybody, even if you just need a better pair of eyes. The one thing that we, that I sometimes ask for um, is a, a card, it's called a rule track retractor. It's, and there's two, there's a thoracic one and a cardiac one. And I always get them confused because I never know which one is actually the better one, but it's actually the cardiac one. And it's like this contraption that goes on the side of the bed. And then it's got like this wheelie that you put under the sternum and you like crank on it and it like lifts up your sternum. And so I've used it for deep paras um, if it gives me a better view, but you could maybe also use it for this if you don't really think it's very, very deep because it can give you better visualization. Um, so when I do big goiter sometimes and I, whether or not I think I might need thoracic, I sometimes ask them to have the cardiac rule tract retractor. Um, Cooper retractor, we, yeah, we call it a rule tract, I don't know, but um, available too. And that gives, that's another way to get some better visualization. Nice. So excellent points all. Uh, I wanted to throw it out there. I've not been monitoring the chat, but any of the uh, fellows getting into this situation this year or seen something like this before and any uh, other pearls of wisdom that you all want to offer? The one, the one other thing I will say is um, I always call our thoracic surgeons, um, but I know recently I was talking about this with Do Dr. Evans and he was saying that, you know, he's like, I usually just make sure one of the cardiac guys are working because so the thoracic surgeons do so much minimally invasive stuff. They actually, the cardiac surgeons are probably the ones who open the chest more than anybody, which is, which is true. So, um, cardiac or thoracic will be your best bet. Yeah, I would echo that. And certainly for the fellows going out there, make friends with the with, with those colleagues, right? I mean, go over the imaging together, talk about some of your strategy, some of what you might anticipate in doing. And then the preparation part is really key. You know, before the operation even starts, letting the anesthesiologist know, you know, they maybe have some blood available, that chances are low, but it's possible. Um, and then you know, when it does happen, and it will at some point, you know, in your career, uh, you know, certainly packing the wound and just getting control of the situation, right? Not freaking out. I mean, I think 
as with all these situations, it's like a trauma situation, right? You got to make sure you got to control not just the patient and the bleeding and all that, but control yourself and control the, the environment because everyone's going to be listening to you, watching you as the, uh, as, the, as the attending surgeon. And yeah, getting control of the situation. Then sometimes you can just see it. Sometimes it, like, like Carmen said, it's just like a small thing that you need, just need to go to control it, or it's just back bleeding from the goiter itself. But the more troublesome thing is if it's coming from the innominate or some other kind of um, low-lying vessel there, in which case you might need another uh, pair of hands and eyes. Um, and just, yeah, make, make, make friends and let them know ahead of time. They don't like being called. No one likes getting called in the middle of the case when they've not been able to review anything or, or, or be prepared. So you can usually anticipate this situation. Um, and yeah, those are some of the major points. Um, anyone else, like, uh, anyone want to holler stuff off the chat? I, I don't have it. Open. Elliot Scott says, uh, I did this. I, I did see this one key was to tee off the incision. I suppose making a very low incision is, uh, in general, I do. I mean, I'm sure all of you do. Um, these tend to be super large and it's probably best to keep a low incision and then you can tee it off if you absolutely Why do. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. Can I, can I real quick before we move on, pick your brains about tips yeah. and tricks, what your favorite instrument is for the mediastinal mobilization, other than just like a finger bluntly moving in there or like a nice curved big Kelly, like what are your favorite things to really just get that capsule open so it can just pop out at you as like the dream mediastinal mobilization? This. Yeah, your finger. Okay. That's what I figured. So I've used a spoon too, but it's yeah. never a, quite the same. It's be a teaspoon. It can't be the soup spoon. They'll bring you like a soup spoon, which is like this big thing. You know, it has to be like narrow and like able to like get in that little space. I found that a nice, like Kelly gets like a little bit further than I, my finger can. Like the biggest, fattest Kelly they offer. Yeah, it's got to be fat and blunt. One. Yeah, like the obese Kelly. Um, it'll get in there, but. Hang on. <laughs> Tracy, you're saying super morbidly obese. Is that what you said, Dr. Shen? No, I said the uh, like a fat Kelly, a pay on, like a oh, fat Kelly. Yeah. Oh, pay on, yeah. Tracy, what were you saying? No, I just, I was just saying, I'm amazed they bring you a spoon in the OR if you want one. Yeah, we have them. The, the we rectal, have them, yeah. The rectal surgeons use it for transanal um, excisions and then the prostate, uh, for some prostate operations, they have them around. Um, we, so we, ha we have them. We have them pill packed in them. Yeah, we always joke. So Orlo Clark has a lot of wonderful, amazing gifts, but maybe the reason he was the world's best endocrine surgeon, he has like these super long fingers and he could like get down there and do all this stuff. All right, let's move on to the next case. All right, this is an adrenal case. So um, yeah, you're basically first year in practice again, uh, you get referred this 65 year old man, primary hyperaldo, totally biochemically proven, AVS, the whole nine yards. And you've got an eight millimeter left adrenal adenoma, but he's largish and I know I'm in San Francisco, I'm not in Texas and Wisconsin and, and Tennessee and these places that have bigger patients. So maybe it's more than 42, let's say it's 45 or something like that. And this is a patient of mine. So my CT may be not as impressive as others, but the point is it's a fat left aldo as we called it, um, or obese left aldo. Um, what's your decision-making around this? And will your approach change? Would you consider recommending the patient lose weight? What are some of those uh, things? Let's start with uh, Tracy. So today's patient, which was actually Dr. Dream's patient, was had a BMI of 59, so we're oh, right in the same. <laughs> and she actually threatened to cancel him if he didn't lose weight, and I think he, he lost like five pounds, he said. Um, and he was very proud, apparently, of his five-pound weight loss. But um, So I think, you know... And it was a left-sided aldo? It was a right-sided aldo. Okay. Um, you know, I think it's, it's hard, you know, when I think any patient with obesity... Um, when they're seeing you for endocrine issues can be challenging, especially when they're like the little paras or like the goiters and you know that their obesity is much more a risk factor for anything that they have than, than that. I think it's a little bit different with Aldo because, you know, obviously the hypertension can have severe effects. Um, you know, I mean, I think you can encourage them to lose all the weight they can, but uh, you know, whether or not they actually will and if they have significant enough hypertension, you end up taking it out. BMI 42 is more comfortable, more is higher than I feel comfortable doing from a retroperitoneal approach. Although on your imaging, the guy looks like he doesn't have a lot of retroperitoneal fat as much as transabdominal fat, but I think the positioning sometimes makes it hard. Um, so I would probably do this transabdominally with the robot. Uh, all right, uh, Carmen, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, I. Uh, 
these are tough. Uh, actually, I, th I would say that some of the tougher adrenalectomies are the hyperaldos, particularly when you're starting, um, because many of them have uh, the fat inside for whatever reason. And <laughs> the adrenal is not a big, huge mass. Um, so you well, have to you have to know your way around. Um, so and yes, uh, they I I have gone sort of back to the transabdominal approach for these. I I, I call this the pancake, and you got to get the pancake all the way around. But really, if you follow if you follow the planes in this, and I get and I guess you have to have your learning curve uh, past you. Uh, to, to do, to go through all the planes. And it, then it's, it's not as hard. Um, and, um, and it, it, it really, if you, if you take a wide breath of stuff around the, the, the adrenal, like you would for cancer, it, it really is not as hard, but it, these were the hardest cases for me when I started, I, I have to say. That, that well, that, yeah, that's why it's out there. So would you, have you encouraged anyone to lose weight uh, in this kind of scenario? Uh, they, they won't. Uh, you can, they won't. Uh, you can do it, They're, but they won't. And and uh, you just end up doing them. But uh, but now I'm sort of the one that gets most of the aldos here and I've kind of developed a way in which I do them and they're kind of fun. <laughs> I, th I would say the rights are easier than the lefts, uh, but- uh, yeah, That's why, yeah. So this is the left one, yeah. which uh, for the fellows- They are the most difficult. To, yeah, this is the case that's gonna be the most challenging. You think it's easy because it's lateralized, it's localized, it's whatever. And then yeah. in traditional settings, left is actually often easier than right because you don't have to worry about IVC and the liver and things like that. But this situation, I've been in the situation where you cannot find the stupid thing because it's the same color as yeah. the fat that's surrounding it. And you're basically swimming around and the fat bleeds as we all know, and it can be very, very messy. Uh, yeah, Libby, yeah. what are your thoughts? So I think the one thing you guys have heard is this is tough, right? And so I, I think the one thing you wanna think about kind of agnostic even to this particular case is what do I want to stack my first year with? And, and, you know, giving yourself the ability to succeed before you sometimes um, choose the more challenging case it is okay to consider. Um, and what I mean by that is if you are working with individuals that are um, supportive of you, it, it's okay to have some of these conversations about, is this the right first um, adrenal for me to be doing in my pr own practice. The other thing that I would say is go ahead and in, in cases you know that are going to be challenging, go ahead and set up a plan so that how much time am I going to spend doing X before I realize that I need to move on? And whether that moving on is changing your approach whether moving on is having an agreement with one of your fellow faculty members to be like, I'm gonna work at this for, for 60 minutes. And then if I haven't made progress, I'm gonna ask that, I'm gonna phone a friend. But if you start making some of these guidelines for yourself in the operating room, it really helps you stay on course so that you aren't flailing two and a half hours in, like what, you know, <laughs> what have I done? And you've got, you know, you're starting to doubt yourself. It just, it's challenging. So making that game plan when you start is really important and, and understanding that it's okay to want to succeed before you load your cases with a bunch of really tough ones. I think yeah, along I those lines, um, when you have cases like this, when you're starting, and I did this for a number of years, you know, and I, is to make sure that somebody's around or in town. And even if, you don't think you'll need them. Like I didn't, you know, when I started, it was myself and Tina Yen here and, and Dr. Wilson, who wasn't doing as much adrenals already by then. But, you know, I, for a number of years when I started, I didn't book an adrenal unless I knew one of my partners was in town. Um, not because I called them in necessarily, but um, it was sort of like, okay, if I get in trouble, there's no one else in the hospital that knows how to do this operation. Um, and then you, you end up 
This is so important advice, guys. Um, and that's not just with adrenals, right? That's like with big. If you're out. able to have a partner. If you have a partner, right. 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 If you're able to have a partner, or even if there's, I don't know, an perhaps experienced general surgeon, an someone experienced else. General surgeon laparoscopy. I yep. mean, a, MIS type person. Yeah, yeah. But uh, th these are the hardest, and I like uh, like Tracy have been doing them robotically, and it's uh, quite a quite a difference in my ability, to be honest. Uh, versus lap, but that's controversial. <laughs> yeah, thoughts from the uh, from the fellows about this situation or about similar cases you may have seen or done this year? Again, I'm not monitoring the, uh, the chat. Yeah. I just wanna say, so when I did board of this case that I did today, I presented it at our multidisciplinary conference because I didn't wanna unilaterally make a decision to take someone with a BMI of 40, 59. And both Tracy and Doug agreed it needed to go. And I told them, that's great, but one of you has to be in the room with me. <laughs> and Dr. Wang was very kind enough to sit in the room and work on other things while I had my moment. So <laughs> that's, that's, I have a, great that's a good one to have homes. under your belt, Sophia. It's right. what, 50 mm -hmm. something. <laughs> yeah, 59. Yeah. And we, we, you know, I think the highest for me has been in the 60s, and that is not fun. Yeah. Um, I, never, I will say there was a lot of, um, very intimidated by the BMI to the point where I think I like almost got lost with it. And Tracy was like, where are you? What are you doing? And I was like, oh yeah. So just having someone reorient you and get out of your mind games, I think is really helpful. Yeah, but be selective, it is okay. Um, especially with here, I mean, it's it, there is medical management for this particular disease process. And this is not, you know, some kind of failure if you do refer it to a, you know, tertiary or a different center. Um, if you are in, in an environment where you don't have backup. Um, and I think that's really important. Dr. Gu tells the story. There was a medical legal case that he reviewed of a uh, inexperienced fellowship trained um, endocrine surgeon who took out the tail of the pancreas instead of the left adrenal. And, um, you know, and we all say, oh man, how did that happen? But, you know. I was going to say when I've, I've reviewed some cases with that and that's entirely possible because you could get lost in there. So anyway, uh, so just I, use good judgment. Uh, and if there's any question also, and I'm gonna sell our uh, our faculty up the river here, but you know, just call your fellowship director and say, hey, I've got this case, check it out. Here's some pictures and what do you think? Blah, blah, blah. So rely on, uh, you know, misery loves company. Rely on your your, your colleagues and, and mentors uh, even after you're out in practice. I'm so let's gonna, keep going. We're, can sorry. I think yeah. can I say one more thing? brain yeah. for an objective cutoff. So for RP, I've always used like a nine centimeter threshold between skin and essentially kidney parenchyma as like a, nope, can't approach that. Let's do transabdominal. Do you have a good rule of thumb for, is, is it either a centimeter or is it a BMI threshold that you use to say like, mm, let's stay out of trouble with this one? For me, is, is the retroperitoneal fat, to be honest, and yeah. the position of the adrenal relating to the hilum of the kidney. So if it's too far caudad, it's difficult. If it's, um, if it's in a sea of fat, I just absolutely hate it from the back. And I don't think there's a perfect recipe for how to choose it, but those are kind of my big stoppers is which is interesting because folks are, are going for Cushing's and for um, uh, refractory pituitary based Cushing's from the back. And it's, for me, it's like a, a sea of fat and it's just not my favorite. So I go from the front, but people defer on that. Tracy, where are you? Yeah, best? I don't think I have one hard and fast rule. I mean, I look at how much fat they have. Um, I look at the size and the location of the tumor, um, and it's a little bit of just not even just an absolute BMI or retroperitoneal fat distance. It's sort of the, the way they're shaped, because when you position them in that retroperitoneal position, sometimes just even their body habitus will affect how you can access. And if they have a really short torso, then that rib space isn't huge. You're not going to get enough space back there. Um, so it's kind of all those things. I'll also say that sometimes I think the some of the most challenging retroperitoneals are the really skinny people because they have absolutely no room. And so I think that sometimes is, um, can be really challenging too. So I don't know what that is in Birmingham, Alabama. Well, no, I mean like really skinny. I mean like objectively by anyone's standards, like BMI, like low twenties kind of skinny. Um, 
Um, but when you have the thin patients, it's actually can be really, it can be just as challenging to do, um, I think, retroperitoneal. And the only other thing I was going to say on the left side is I'm going to channel my inner Barb Miller for a second and say if you're really having trouble, and I have never done this myself, but I, if you are having trouble identifying the adrenal, you can always think about using your interoperative ultrasound, right? Um, if that will help you. Sorry, Thanks. one last uh, quick question, because yeah. we have an a, adrenal tomorrow and a BMI, a patient with a BMI of 57, and it's also a right. And I just a question on um, port placement. And do you ever do like a right-sided varus? Because if they're in the lateral decubitus and you're planning to do transabdominal, or how would you approach uh, ports for um, some of these heavier patients? Are you doing it lap or robotic? Lap. Mm -hmm. It's a, is the liver large? I bet it is. It's fatty. Yes, probably. it's the yeah, classic fatty so liver. I never use the varus on the okay. right if I'm doing it laparoscopic. Okay. Liver. Doing it robotically, I'll do the OptiView or the varus on the right because our ports are much, much lower. Okay. Um, yeah. In the abdomen. So you, I know I'm away from liver. Um, if you absolutely have to, and, and I agree with Tracy, is, uh, is you, you can always go through an open like uh, Hassan and then insufflate and then do whatever you need to do. I, 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 I use OptiView okay. pretty much for almost everyone at okay. this point, but I think but you've um, got to watch that liver. You know, I, it makes me, uh, yeah. I mean, just lap with the liver. It makes me a little nervous. It depends on their liver too. I mean, yeah. Yeah, hopefully when we put them in the lateral decubitus and the fat kind of falls down a little bit, we could do a Hassan um, like we do. But I am doing robot like Tracy too. Yeah. So, so, so that's yeah, why I offered, I that offered the, uh, a, a different spot to start. Yeah. So I don't know. When, how do you do it? Yeah, I, I was going to say Visaport in that situation is really, yeah. really key. I wonder too if you can actually be a little bit lower with your first port anyway, because if you use like a bariatric instrument, like bariatric trocar, you know, the longer trocars, um, cause you don't actually, you, you want to be a little bit further, I think, um, to have the access. Cause otherwise you're going to be right on top of liver and, and stuff like that. So, and don't hesitate to use a fifth port if you need it. Uh, if you're doing laparoscopically, uh, just even for just pure liver retraction, that mm -hmm. of course requires an, an additional person to help with that retraction. So yeah, don't, don't hesitate to move your ports around, uh, once you get in there. Um, so. It's so very true. I mean, you're, you, you're, you're going to save this patient a big incision. It, right. it doesn't matter, like a tiny little hole for you to right. get extra help, if you will. Great. Thanks. Right. Wow. I think that's two cases in 30 minutes. We're killing it because I have 13 cases, but I'm, I'll, I'll move along and we'll, we don't have to do them all. Uh, but it's really fun. I love uh, getting everyone's input and uh, your all's, all your all's questions. So let's keep going. All right. This is not a clinical thing. This is interpersonal. All right. So um, you are in early practice, 45 year old woman, chip shot, 1.1 centimeter right PTC. She read, she read the 2015 ATA guidelines said, you know, right thyroid lobectomy alone for a low risk limited cancer. Surgery is perfect, path shows clean margins, no angio invasion or mets or anything else. Just like stone cold normal, 1.1 centimeter. And uh, you're all set, it's all good. And then the endocrinologist calls and says, hey, new person, what is up? You are supposed to be doing total thyroidectomy for thyroid cancer. I need to do RAI. This is ridiculous. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I, well, you're not doing enough surgery. What do you do in this situation? So uh, Carmen, let's start with you. Again, you're in early practice. You just started. Oh boy. <laughs> this, this should never happen to me because I need to talk to my endocrinologist ahead of time. Ahead of time. Okay. So and, that's a good uh, thing. Okay and try to figure out where they're standing, you know, what, what's their thinking and why. Um, I must admit that I don't, I didn't always agree with some of my referring endocrinologist and, and it's kind of a tricky situation, but uh, to avoid this event, you should uh, hopefully talk to your referring physicians and see what they kind of prefer. Now, first thing first, in my opinion, you should do what's right for the patient. And, um, and, uh, if the, if an adequate procedure is the procedure you're, you're offering, hopefully you're offering an adequate procedure to the patient, 
or if the patient desires a different sort of thing, you, I think you, you can do that. Um, now you're faced now with the endo on the phone because this happened. Um, then um, uh, what's the endo saying? <laughs> well, they're saying basically that you didn't do enough surgery. Uh, yeah. That in his practice, total thyroidectomy for all papillary thyroid cancer, he wants to give RAI and you got to take her back for a completion. Well, I mean, I, I don't know about that. I mean, I think I would, I would address, I probably lose the endo, uh, uh, honestly, in this situation, I may, You're, I may lose my okay, And You are starting your practice, Dr. Solorzano. You yeah, want I know, to but that's what I'm saying. I don't think, yeah. I don't think I would let this happen because I'm going to talk to my endocrinologist. That, that's my teaching point here. And that's your teaching point. Right. You're going to talk to them. And then what do you, how do you deal with an endocrinologist that perhaps is not up to up to uh, current standards. Yeah, that's standards, the, right? Standard. That's a tough one. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one. I'm going to do what's right for the patient first. All right. And, Libby, uh, Libby, I, Libby, might, I might have to starve, I guess. So. <laughs> Libby, what's your, what's your, what's your answer? Yeah. So, so these are challenging and um, I, I'm not going to lie. I was in this position, not, not infrequently as a beginning surgeon working with endocrinologists that were, um, that were much more senior and, and um, had the answer. And so it really is, um, it, it, there is a lot of interpersonal discussion that goes along with this and, and how you want to handle it. Um, I, I do wanna start with saying, I absolutely agree with Carmen, talking with the endocrinologist upfront in these cases is key so that you all, because you're a team, unless you're giving RAI yourself or you know those kinds of things, you really are working as a team. Um, and so you wanna be able to, you want to be able to have that discussion with the patient up front, kind of what the, the planned approach is. But if you're finding yourself in this type of position, um, you know, yeah. I, I agree with, with Carmen in that I would never do something that was substandard care for a patient. There is sometimes care that is not substandard, that is just also standard of care. Um, and and so, uh, you know, in those cases, a lot of times when I was uh, more junior, it was they wanted to give more RAA than I thought was necessary. And there wasn't, you know, we were before some of the more recent ATA guidelines um, <laughs> taking myself. So it was a little less clear what the answer is. But in this setting, you know, I think you have to have your conviction. You guys are all well-trained surgeons. You know that if it's a 1.1 centimeter right PTC, and you've done the appropriate operation that that doing a completion is 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 not the the right answer and you can stand by that and and I will say with Carmen you're never going to you're never going to put the patient at risk so if you've done the right thing you know having the discussion with the with the endocrinologist to explain your thought process on this is what you can do um, and just because you're more junior doesn't mean that you're not right in some of this. And, and so, you know, don't go, I, I don't need to act like Jerry Maguire here. Is that who that is? Is that Jerry Maguire? It's Tom Cruise, yeah. And Jerry yeah, Maguire. there it is. Um, the you don't need to match them with this, but you can very calmly, you know, the more enraged they get, the less, you know, the more calm you need to be and, and just explain your situation. But it's okay. I mean, you can be right and, and disagree in this setting. Yeah, Tracy, would you drop the, not name drop, but just say I'm in where I trained, you know, I did this, or the guidelines say X, Y, Z, would, do you find that approach? I mean, obviously it's going to be different for different people, but do you use that ever in your uh, discussions? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you almost, you have, I, I, you know, I, I think saying where you train, you could say this was my experience, right? This is how I, you know, learn from whatever. I think the more compelling thing will be the data, right? Showing that you know what the data are, the outcomes are. And, you know, it depends on the person, right? The person might just be honestly very receptive to a change in their practice patterns, but they don't know the data and they just need to hear it from somebody and they'll think about it. Um, so there's one type of person that could be calling you. The other type of person won't care what you're saying where you train, what guidelines you quote, they are gonna believe what they're gonna believe. And so anything you say could possibly just get them more annoyed, right? Because anything you say will be seen as kind of like showing up their knowledge or their practice pattern. So it also depends on the type of person that you're talking to. Um, 
Um, but I think, like Libby said, I think if you can demonstrate you, that you aren't, that you have a grasp of the knowledge of the outcomes and the data, and you're doing the right thing by the patient, then if they're not willing to accept that at the end of the day, then they're not willing to accept that, you know? Libby, you're, you're muted. The tricky part of all of this, at which we've all been is, and this is why you definitely want to understand what the endocrinologist is coming from first, is when they go to the patient and say, Dr. Grubbs has done the inappropriate surgery. And that is such a horrible position when you've, you've, you've got this patient in this middle ground between two physicians and they don't know which way, they don't know what to do, right? Because they, 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 they believe both of you and they're very conflicted. So that's why it's really, really wonderful to not to, very early on, even when you don't know the referring, you know, physician that's calling you and okay, you pick up the phone and talk to them about, you know, this is what I anticipate. And this is what I'm thinking so that you can talk to the patient, you know, so that you know what you're doing when you're counseling the patient before the surgery. Yeah, excellent. And this is also an opportunity if it doesn't exist. I mean, this is where a multidisciplinary tumor board uh, can also be very helpful. Uh, because then it's not just you making this solo decision. This is, you know, basically a consensus um, um, evaluation by combined, um, and not, you know, experts is a loaded word, but basically people who, who deal with this particular disease process. And so that's, this is an opportunity. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why if you, if there is not a tumor board type setup in your new practice environment, uh, it, it's very helpful. I mean, not only does it give you an opportunity to talk about cases in a multidisciplinary fashion, but it also helps you to kind of establish your bona fides, right? This is my, you know, training, and th these are the things I learned and saw, and I'm tr I'm trying to practice at the cutting edge of what's uh, what's current practice. Any uh, any comments or thoughts from the uh, the fellows about this type of situation? When there's a comment from yeah. Oliver. Oh, let's hear what's what, what I gotta say. If he could say it himself or I'll read it. Yeah. Oliver, what do you got? Uh, thank you. Yeah, so I'm I'm quickly realizing that I'm gonna be leaving this institution that Dr. Ye has built and I'm gonna be going out and all these things that happen are probably not gonna the real world. Yeah, the real world. So not lot of can all lobectomies for rush pathology. So we get an answer. Most of these are on Thursday in the surgery center. We get an answer by end of business on Friday. So that if a patient does need a completion, we can get them on in the next couple of days. And is that practice common uh, at other institutions, rush pathology, or is that kind of um, not so commonplace? What is rush pathology? <laughs> so we used and, to. We used and, to and what is getting back in the OR um, four days later, whenever you want? What to? is that? <laughs> um, it's not common. We used to do that here. We used to actually get a page by like 9 a.m. the next morning. They would look at all of our lobes and um, we'd have an answer so we could do the same thing. I think we ended up abandoning that just for a variety of reasons, but also because um, it barely changed our practice patterns. And now with lobe increasing more and more and um, knowing that there's no harm done if you wait, six or eight weeks from an oncologic perspective, right? Um, we kind of abandon that practice. I mean, having said that, if you have the ability to set that up, then that's great, right? You, and you have the OR time or the availability and your OR is reasonable to work with you. I think that's great, but it's certainly not common practice. Yeah, Dr. yeah Oliver, how many, how many times are you actually utilizing this? Um, maybe a half dozen throughout the year. We just did one today. That's why it's top of mind. We did her low back to me last week and did a completion today. Yeah. I mean, I think Tracy's point is a good one. Oncologically, I don't think there's that much difference. I mean, I think there's the balancing of peace of mind for the patient because some patients are in a big rush to know and to get things done, but a lot of patients don't want to have two anesthesias in a week. Right. So Dr. Du used to have a setup where he would book the patient twice, right? The lobectomy one week and then have the slot at the end of the day at the, the following week, you know, the following Thursday or whatever it was. Um, but he abandoned that practice as well because a lot of patients were not really that in that much of a hurry. Um, but set it up how you like, if you have the capability to do so, that's fine. Um, but I would say uh, it's logistically a little bit challenging, I think. And you have to have pathologists on board that are willing to kind of move at your pace. Thank you. Also, I think it, uh, 
the old way of doing things, and this may have started this is, well, that was before my time as like the surgeon would explore both sides, right? And that was probably the reason. And that again, before our time, because ultrasound has been around for quite a while where uh, you explore both sides and then remove one side and having to go back in that setting was a disaster. I mean, you didn't want to do that in less than, you know, if, unless you did it right away. So I think going back, you know, in six weeks, yeah, it's a little hard at the, the very start, you know, where you're trying to lift up the strap muscles that are plastered onto the, the remnant, but that's, that's about it. So I don't, I don't know what else. Yeah, so my, what I teach um, when I'm doing an initial lobectomy in this situation is um, try not to touch the other side at all. And so I try to keep that plane between the strap muscles um, unviolated. So if I am going back, you're right, Carmen, you go in there, it's a mess right on the anterior surface of the trachea. You just go a little bit to the side and find that unviolated space. And then you're able to, uh, to then find the thyroid surface pretty easily. Tracy, were you about to say something? No, I was going to agree. I think some of it, like at least here, when Dr. Wilson set it up, it was just because everybody who had any kind of thyroid cancer had a total, right? And that was just what we did. So it didn't matter. I think now too, you know, sometimes you get the path back and, you know, is, is it a, what size papillary? Do they really want the other half out? You know, is it minimally, you know, if it's a follicular cancer, is there a little bit of invasion? Is there a lot of bit of, there's just so many more things to talk about, it seems like, um, to make that decision that um, that's- So the teaching a long time ago was, oh, you got to go back within two weeks or it's going to be a nightmare, right? But but it, but it isn't. I mean, it's, a, again, that's only, I guess, if you explore both sides, which is a very, very much a thing of the past, okay. 30 years ago. Yeah. All right. More. So I don't, more, okay. <laughs> I lose track of time there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's keep moving on. Thank you for your input, everyone. Uh, all right, here we go. More thyroid cancer. Uh, we'll start with Libby on this one. Uh, all right, so you did this uh, 35 year old man, locally advanced PTC, left lateral neck nodal metastases. Operation went great. Sent the patient home, but then you get the phone call a couple of days later that uh, his wound starts leaking this milky fluid. I love oh, the yeah. picture. I know that's good. That's good. And that's exactly what it looks like. Right guys. I mean, it really is like when, when people are like, how I know if I have a Kyle leak, I'm like, it's going to be like someone put milk in your drain. So the first thing I will say is I use a drain in lateral necks. I don't use them in central necks. I do use them in lateral necks. And when I put a drain in, I don't take it out the day after they, they earn that drain for at least uh, uh, usually a, a four uh, day period um, it, when they're home really eating real food again. Um, and, and yeah, the left lateral neck is going to be the one of higher concern. Um, but with a Kyle leak, it, it depends. So, so I will tell you, so I, I use the drain and I challenge them with fat before I take it out. Um, if you have a Kyle leak and I've had Kyle leaks in the past, I, um, I, I do some things yeah, I'm, I'm taking a step back, but I, I did go to the Doug Evans school where I still use, uh, I do a, a challenge with half and half down the OG tube um, during surgery to make sure that they don't have an, a rip roaring Kyle leak. So knock on wood that I don't, um, I haven't had a, a Kyle leak I've had to take back um, in my time because I, I take a lot of time to make sure there's not a, a, a Kyle leak during um, the operation. Um, but um, it, when I've had, so a high volume leak, you got to understand that you need to take back. If it's a low volume leak, you can, I start with a low fat um, diet. And then I'm usually pretty quick to go ahead and do um, uh, uh, octreotide. I bring them in, I give them the, the um, sub Q while I'm waiting for their, um, um, for I'm waiting for their, uh, their um, deeper one to, you know, to take effect. Um, so that's how I handle it. I will tell you guys, when I started though, I was so, I, my first Kyle leak, um, my patient lost 15 pounds because I had put him on a no fat diet for like <laughs> three months. You do not need to do that. Um, but but usually the low fat diet plus or minus um, octreotide usually works. And have you ever re-explored? I've not had to re-explore. I've never had a high volume one. Uh, Tracy? I re-explored once. It was, um, it was, and it was actually, she had a ton of, she had a really bad cancer. She had a ton of lymphatics in her central compartment, which I think was what was causing it. And we had to oversew it. Um, 
So what date did you take her back? I think I took her back on like post-op day five or six. So it was just at the border of not a good time to do it. Um, and, and it turned out okay, but, um, but yeah, it was not great. Carmen, your thoughts? I would like to say I haven't had one, but I have. Um, um, interesting, I've had two colleagues, uh, one on, both on the left. All right, so don't think that, sorry, both on the right. Don't think that it's just the left, sorry about that. Left, left and right are difficult for me. Um, and one was pretty high volume, uh, 1,500 a day. Um, so I put the patient on TP and that was a long time ago. I, I had tried a little bit, you know, low fat diet, but it didn't seem to go down. So I put the patient on TP then and I got lucky and it sealed. Um, and then the second one I just had about six months ago and the patient uh, had uh, no trouble overnight. I just leave a drain, like Libby said, and I removed it the next day. I don't, I don't do any challenge. I just let them eat. And then if I don't see anything, I just pulled it. And then the, co the guy called a couple of weeks later or a week later I remember, that he, he had a, a, a full neck. And I thought, oh, that's just a seroma. Huh? Uh, so I brought him to the clinic. I, I uh, ultrasound guidance and I pulled back and there. It was kind of milkish. It wasn't full, like it was a little milkish, but not fully milkish. So anyway, I um, then, uh, so I tapped it dry and then he came back again. So I went to interventional, left the drain, put him on low fat diet and sealed. So that's my experience. And uh, some people have described using ICG when they take back the, the patient to try to see it and seal it, but I don't know. How did you see yours, Tracy? Um, so I, I, this was, this was a while ago and I think I made Doug come with me and he did his little heavy cream in the OG tube and it didn't work. Um, but I think just by sitting there and watching it, you could see sort of where it was, the lymph was kind of accumulating. So we kind of knew like she was pretty, she was really high volume. So like it, it just, if you sat there for five minutes, it just, it just kind of, <laughs> but but the lymph just it just kind of accumulated i will say that i remember was it this year's esu that you guys were talking about using to seal and stuff i've used to seal it doesn't prevent seromas i actually think sometimes and it doesn't it, prevent it actually, i think it encourages seromas yeah, but I don't think it stops Kyle leaks. I mean, I use it, but don't think that that's going to prevent everything from happening. Yeah, that's the James Lee uh, promise, I guess he was saying. Or no, it's during some I'll kind of death in the series. <laughs> but, but I will say the other thing about, um, and the, one of the most controversial ESU cases I ever presented was the discussion around leaving a drain in the lateral neck. Um, and I don't care. I'm going to leave a drain in the lateral neck. It's I, I don't believe anyone that says they don't have a seroma. I don't believe what, anyone. What's controversial about it? It's oh a freaking my God. I mean, <laughs> I, thought oh it, I thought we were going to talk about the guys so like thyroid cancer. We talked for like 20 minutes about leaving a drain. I don't believe anyone who says they don't. Have, I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone on the call. I don't believe you if they say they don't develop a seroma or something. Um, it doesn't Can matter. I hear what drain. were the arguments against it? Just because, so I will preface this with, I am trained, fellowship trained at a place that we are no drain, like outpatient everybody, but that like realistically is not going to shape my whole you practice. send them home with a drain. They can be an outpatient. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> my, my residency training was everybody gets a drain. My fellowship training has been the other side of the spectrum. So I will fall naturally somewhere in between, but I, like, what was the argument against draining that they could actually stand up at the podium and, and argue with that? So everyone just basically said, I don't have a seroma. I've never uh, had a seroma. No patient um, ever had a seroma. That, I don't believe I'll it. tell you that our group is pretty evenly, or at least a few of us don't do any drains in these situations and a couple do. Um, and the argument, Kim, is like basically that you don't need it, <laughs> but you know, uh, maybe when I get burned or whatever, that uh, that that will happen. But 
you know, I, I am very, very cognizant of, you know, especially on the left side, being careful down low and making sure that you're not, um, you know, boogering around or whatever. And then I do Valsalva at the end of all the cases and we just make sure there's no uh, lymph leak or, or any kind of other fluid or bleeding, of course. Um, and I just have not felt the need to, uh, to stick in a drain for um, any of those things. I, I think I'm in the Herb Chen uh, school that you, uh, that you are, have been trained in. Um, I think that the drain uh, thing is, I, I train initially putting in a drain for everything. And then I stop putting drains for most things. And uh, talking to our uh, head and neck surgeons, they put in drains still. And their argument is swelling. And I have to agree some with them that I think that the swelling that you see, you don't need them. You don't, you're not going to put them in for a hematoma. You, and that seromas are not a big thing because we don't make the huge coker incisions unless you got a huge goiter in that setting, uh, substernal and everything. I do leave a drain. But I think that the drain does bring down the swelling. I, I think I'm going to have to agree with my head and neck uh, surgeon. Not that I leave them, but I think it does. If you leave a drain, um, it does bring down the swelling. Is your that's short, swelling that doesn't choke yeah. anybody or anything but it's like a seven french flat jp like i can't believe i'm asking this <laughs> that's 10 round ten. really ten. tiny yeah, the round ones are nice they come out see round as well we actually had two kyle leaks in the last like six months and one of them was fine it was managed with just a drain and the other one we actually had to take back to upsize the drain because those seven french flat was left and it wasn't working in the whole neck oh, like, a, like a 10 french fluted blake round, yeah the round blake round one that's yeah. stiff not the flat one, the round one. And I, I've learned, I leave it above the straps. So I'll close the straps and I'll just lay my drain over the straps. Mm. Do you leave the tip down deeper in the deeper space? And no, just the top. Interesting. I, I put I, mine flat on in the left lateral neck or the right lateral neck. I don't know. Maybe I, I'm learning a lot tonight. Maybe I'll stop. <laughs> Well, I mean, I would say for the fellows, it's probably, you know, especially in this kind of situation, it's probably the, the better part of Valor to drain, um, you know, uh, because I think if there's any controversy and I think, you know, Tracy feels pretty strongly, um, I'd say, no, seriously. And I think, you know, it, it's probably um, reasonable in, in, in a lateral neck dissection. I'd say for most of the central operations, uh, I think the data is pretty clear that you, know, you do not uh, need it. Um, maybe in a special situation like, like what Carmen's like saying. Goiter or something. Yeah, but I would say it's not, you're not going to get faulted for doing it. No one's going to like make fun of you. Oh, there's that drain placing surgeon person. Um, and so, you know, if you're feeling that, that that's necessary, then have, by all means uh, do it. Now, the time frame of when to remove it, I think Libby was talking several days, Carmen's the next day, that type of thing. I think you'll have to kind of develop your clinical judgment, clinical practice around that. The, the one thing I was going to say about the drain, the lateral neck was that um, one of the things that I've noticed sometimes is it can take a few days, right? People aren't eating a whole lot for the Kyle to really develop. Um, so one of the things I've noticed is a couple, a couple of times is, well, actually the one lady I was talking, we went back with the next day when she went home, like there just wasn't something right. And like, she had like a hundred cc's in her drain pretty quickly and it didn't look milky for like three or four days. Um, and so even just a high volume of serous stuff can just be lymph. And, and so that kind of clues me in a little bit too. So it doesn't always have to be just Kyle. It can be lymph, just like a really high volume of lymph as a start. And that should just kind of clue you in if you leave a drain um, that there might be something more than just, you know, normal stuff going on. Oliver has a comment in the chat. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, Oliver, Oliver this is fabulous. Explain this because I think this is fantastic if this works. <laughs> yeah, so um, if you have a leak and, you know, I know most people would go back and try to ligate it in the neck and leave a drain, but if you still have a reasonable output in your drain after re-exploration, then your IR colleagues might be able to do uh, embolization of the thoracic duct and then that's, that's pretty demanding. I've only seen that at one institution. Um, and then in my trauma uh, experience, we had a stab wound to the neck, explored the neck, left a drain and still had a pretty high output leak. And so we did a right VATS and right above the diaphragm, the, the thoracic duct is pretty identifiable there. And you can 
ligate it between clips and send the intervening segment for pathology, kind of like a vagotomy. And uh, right away the output stopped, so. Yeah, those are very uh, good tips. Uh, so yeah, I th I've seen both of those things done, uh, both the thoracic uh, ligation, but also IR uh, embolization. It's very tricky, the IR, IR embolization, you have to have a pretty hotshot uh, IR person to be able to access thoracic duct from the abdomen. Um, so, uh, but if they can do it, it's great. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, let's, let's keep going. Uh, I got another half hour-ish uh, to go. Um, all right, next case, uh, let's talk some hyperpara. This is a little bit more um, kind of standard type case, but again, early practice. Let's put ourselves back in our kind of early days of, uh, of, of doing um, patient selection for surgery. Uh, so you've got the classic, uh, basically normal calcinemic hyperpara. And I put some sample numbers here, but I put the image for a reason. I mean, obviously everyone's perhaps a little bit different, but uh, have you been in this kind of situation trying to make this determination? And how do you go about patient selection for normal calcinemic hyperparathyroidism, primary hyperparathyroidism in your early practice, especially? Uh, Tracy, what do you think? So I would say a patient like this, the most other things that you need to know are what her ionized calcium is and if she's ever had a gastric bypass, a ruin Y. And those are the two pieces of information I think are missing that you that we see right now. Yeah, good. So those are good things to order. I'm just, I mean, I just threw this on here for to like stimulate discussion, but those are very important points. I think the ionized calcium for normal calcemic Hyperpara is a really, really important lab to get. And yeah, of course, during your history, you should be asking all those things. I think for all hyperpara patients is uh, any history of malabsorptive either operations or conditions, because we uh, know that celiac disease and other kinds of malabsorptive um, GI uh, disorders can also lead to um, false diagnosis of primary hyperpara. And the fact that you can, re you can replace someone's vitamin D to 60, it will still take a really long time if it's vitamin D based elevation and PTH to resolve. And our endocrinologists tell us this all the time. Like, don't think that, oh, it's 40, but like it can still take a long time for your PTH to normalize after that. So don't get fooled into thinking that just because it's normal. Um, the thing it. that I look at in this case scenario is um, um, the urine calcium and it, not to rule out FHH or anything, but uh, rather to see if the patient has a <clears throat> bit of a urine leak. I've had folks like that and you can put them on hydrochlorothiazide. Yeah, good call. Uh, Libby, you look very puzzled. What's, uh, what are your No, thoughts? I hate these cases. So I, I, I will say that um, when I started out, especially, I was a kind of by the book person when it came to hyperparathyroidism, meaning I wanted them to meet one of what we consider, if it was asymptomatic, I wanted them to meet a criteria. And why that helped me is because then if, you know, then again, who has said the loneliest place in the world is a surgeon sitting in the operating room by themselves, not able to find a parathyroid. I mean, it's, it's, it's very devastating. I mean, it really is upsetting. And you, and, and for me, when I started, if I was going to be in that position, I wanted to know that I was doing it for a reason that I could hang my hat on, whether it be osteoporosis, whether it be a 24 hour urine, whether it be one unit above normal, whether it be then you know, whatever, whether, whether you go down the route of getting an ultrasound to look for kidney stones, whether you get an x-ray to look for, for fractures, but I, I wanted it to be that. And as I have, as I've aged, I, I have loosened what I, you know, what I will do now because I have become more comfortable. Um, but, but when I started out, oh man, I really liked being able in my operative note to say the indication for surgery was this and to have something that no one could doubt what my indication was for. Um, same with the diagnosis. You really want to make sure you have the diagnosis and you know, to any other group, they'd be like, duh, but you guys know exactly what I mean. You've got to make sure you have the diagnosis. So don't let anybody push you into operating before you are comfortable doing it. And I'll be honest with you, even now with normal calcemic hyper um, para, I will oftentimes have them, I'll talk with the endocrinologist as well, because I just want to make sure that I have, because these are challenging cases um, for sure, um, I think anyway. 
Those are fantastic points. The the fact that um, you know why the heck does this patient got a PTH check? Right, <laughs> he usually comes from some osteoporosis or something. You know, somebody checked the PTH, and the diagnosis is first. And if you think after ruling out all the other possibilities of an elevated PTH, which were mentioned, if you think you're dealing with normal glycemic hyperpara, I do what Lou says. First of all, why are we doing this? And second of all, I better have my endocrinologist on board and I tell the patient I can fail. I mean, all those things. I still do them, but uh, well, you know, maybe not at eight, eight. Yeah, so is there, yeah, is there some kind of cutoff? And again, of course it's gonna vary patient to patient, but yeah. is there some like red line that you say, you know, no way? Not, not. I would say that they tend to have more, a little bit higher calcium than that, uh, than eight, two. Nines, uh, nines we're talking. Nineties. The indication. Nines. I mean, if, if they're eight, if they're, I don't care if they're eight, eight or nine, five, if they have meet no other indication for surgery, you know, what, why are we doing it? If yep. they're not osteoporotic, if they don't have other things, like I, I, I personally, when you're, especially when you're starting out, I, I don't know. I, I, I just, um. I, I, I would agree. I would agree. Be yeah. careful when you're starting out. I, I do it a lot of times for osteoporosis, uh, bad osteoporosis, and some of these folks. But I do. Everybody goes on board. Everybody gets on board. Tracy, would you uh, order an ultrasound or do one in the office just to see? So I should say no. <laughs> um, I will say because of how our protocol works and our new patient coordinator and all that humdrum, um, a lot of the protocol is around getting imaging ready, right? Some of our patients come from far away. And so also a lot of times this stuff is teed up. Um, I think some of our people, like our nurse practitioners will catch it. Like if they see this and be like, oh, the, and we'll kind of be like, oh, let's just hold off on the imaging or, you know, some, some clue might clue us into holding off on the imaging. But there are times when we have patients with maybe equivocal diagnosis that just come with imaging, right? And, and I think you can't be fooled by maybe there's an enlarged parathyroid, maybe there's an enlarged lymph node and they think they may see something, you know, on that. And, and it's hard because sometimes for those patients who, you know, usually the patients with normal calcemic hyperpara are the ones who don't just have mild fatigue, right? They have a laundry list of things that they know that, you know, they think are going to be miraculously cured. And, and so they're very insistent on, on the diagnosis being kind of led down that path and having surgery. So if you do get that imaging, then you're also spending a lot of time saying, okay, you can have a big parathyroid gland doesn't mean that it's not functioning properly and needs to come out. Um, so theoretically, no, in reality, you know, whether it's us ordering it because of a protocol or their primary care or endo somewhere along the way, they've probably gotten some imaging already. Uh, any of the fellows want to weigh in? I'm sure you've seen uh, these kinds of cases. Uh, and the reason I'm putting it up there is that you will be presented with this type of case. It's actually a very common diagnosis nowadays, normal calcemic hyperpara, primary hyperpara. And these are, these are challenging. And I think I agree with all the points about involving the endocrinologist in the discussion, making sure the patient understands that uh, you have to really have an indication for doing the operation before you proceed. And you also have to make sure you actually have the diagnosis. Uh, the only thing I'd add is we had one we have one endocrine I'm sorry one um, endocrinologist who does a lot of the urine studies with the patients and this calcium and the citrate and there are a lot of very um, subtle things that this particular endocrinologist is very helpful I think with some of these patients because they are they're not fun to have because they're very motivated for surgery because they think it will help. Um, I, I'm a lot more liberal in my fellowship practice than I would be, I think, in starting out in just um, six weeks from now um, with these patients. So yes, I operate on these patients probably two or three times a week on normal calcemic, but um, it, I don't have an objective threshold. And that's what I'm really seeking is to, to try and get a sense of where I'll fall with this calcium level to feel comfortable because I can't make them much better than an 8.2, right? So the, the thing I could do for them is make them cripplingly hypocalcemic for a bit. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if I could help them as much as hurt them um, until, until I feel where I'm comfortable on my own 
without that bravado of Herb Chen behind me and these patients that it, that's where I'm struggling with a little bit. And I think it'll take me some time to figure that out, but definitely not at the start. <laughs> Tracy, were you about to say something? Oh, you're unmuted. Yeah, any other fellows uh, have other uh, kind of perspectives for that they've developed over this year or what your philosophy uh, is gonna be going out there? Rashford? I was just wondering if anybody had um, a cutoff for normal hormonal, like, um, you know, obviously if you don't have a, uh, you have a high calcium, but your PTH isn't suppressed to a level you would think it would be, but is that a certain number for you all, maybe over 40 or, you know, over 50? Um, do you operate on those folks at all? Um, again, obviously the indication is important. Great question. Um, <laughs> yeah, what's your answer? Are we around 35? Yeah, I was gonna say four. Uh, yeah, in that ballpark, I, I would just keep testing and just yeah, see. Yeah, test. Know, Sometimes it's the assay, but but you really again we go back to the basics. What your indications are? Don't operate on an image, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that that was sort of what we were getting at, but don't. Because it, it's an exophytic thyroid nodule, and you're right. gonna get in there, <laughs> and you're gonna be so. No, you're just gonna be like what am I doing? Because <laughs> you've committed yourself. Now you're in there, yep. right? You, you, yep. you took the plane off. Now you got to land the plane, right? And so you're, yep. you're, in, you're, in, you're in hot water then. So don't get to that point. Um, good. Well, let me keep going. But that uh, I knew that was going to stimulate some discussion. All right. All right. Here's some fun. So this is a pretty straightforward clinical scenario in, in, from an endocrine standpoint, three centimeter left PTC. Uh, but patient got it diagnosed during the course of workup for breast cancer. So simultaneous cancers, and the patient really does not want to have two operations, and your breast surgery colleague says, oh, I'm willing to work any time, and, you know, you know, I've got block time next week during your block, or I, I'm available during your block time next week, I'm ready to go. Um, what's your stance on combined operations? Carmen, what do you think? Um, I think... This, this case, I don't know if this was just an illustration of any case, but obviously uh, when you have two cancers uh, um, and one needs a more complex surgery, I, I tend to prioritize that one. But, but I'm not against um, doing the two procedures at, at once if they're not huge, if you, if, if, I mean, so I have, I have done yeah, a thyroidectomy in the setting of, I hate to say it in a liver resection, but, uh, it's not, it's not ideal, but, um, Jeez. but I'm so, willing, I, I'm, I'm willing to do it. Um, you know, so you provided, it, like liver resection, coagulopathy, all that jazz you're, you're okay with. Yeah, uh, I mean, but, but it's, you know, some, some of these are just like a lobectomy. It's not, it's not that bad. Um, but yeah, so I'm willing to do it, but I think if you have somebody that needs a thyroidectomy for PTC and they have some other malignancy that, that, that it's like a deadly malignancy. I'm not gonna, I'm probably not gonna, I'm just gonna time it so that the natural history of the other malignancy takes course. And, uh, but if there's an ins insistence, then uh, we'll, we'll potentially do it together or put at another time. Hopefully that, and I don't, yeah. Tracy, what do, you, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think considering, you know, sometimes you have to think about like morbidity for the other, like life expectancy for the other operation, what you're doing, right? But I've done a good, bizarre combinations of operations together sometimes. Um, Who gets to go first? Well, I try to go first. So when I'm doing a neck operation and the other operation is not on the neck, I try to make the argument to go first because then we can sort of see in the OR, like if there's bleeding, you know, or, like, right? or then I tell them if they move the patient, they're going to mess up the NIM tube. So like we really need to go first or something like that. Um, it just depends what makes the most sense. All right. Libby, what do you, what do you think? And yeah, we get all asked to do this a lot. Um, at, at my place. And I will tell you when I was more junior, when I was in your guys' position, I would do it all the time because I thought I was like, oh, I'm just trying to be helpful, right? Like, oh yeah, I'll slip that in. And then the first time that we had a patient that, I 
gastric cancer, right? Like he got Lovenox afterwards and he bled everywhere, but guess who's the only person that had to take him back, <laughs> right? So I don't do it when they're gonna give blood thinners afterwards because we don't use blood thinners with our thyroids. Um, and now I've become much more selective um, and I tend to do, a, if, if the combined surgeries are gonna be under four hours, really of operating time and, um, and it's something that really needs to be done. Uh, you know, just for, for various reasons, I, I, I will consider it. But if it's going to be a larger operation, no way. And, and try. And, and the nice thing is a lot of what we do, especially if it's going to be in the neck, there's hardly ever a time that it, what, what we're doing is going to supersede what other operations occurring. If it's a cancer operation, let's just be honest. Um, and a lot of times we can say, you know what, you just do your, you, you do your part and we'll, we'll come after. And I, I do that a lot more now. And it's just, it, it's, I, I, I find it much better. Yeah. I do find it logistically a lot easier because, you know, not only are you just, it's not just you doing the operation, right? It means the OR staff has to have all the trays, the positioning as, as has already been mentioned and the post-op care, what service they're going to be on, who's going to be following what, and, you know, their concern, the other services concerns are typically not the same as yours. And so there's a lot of different, uh, different considerations. It's not just the surgeon just swooping in and doing something. So my practice has been the same thing. I think I did a few more of these combined things early on, um, just to be kind of feeling like I was being a good team player for not only and for the patient certainly of course, but then also for the um, for the other team. And think about hypocalcemia. Hy hypo. It, it, hypo. Think about what happens if you're doing a combined GI case or other things. Just not that any of you guys are ever going to have hypocalcemia. Um, but if you're doing an operation where you could put them at that risk, just think about what that would be like um, in trying to replace if you can't give them, if they can't absorb well, they don't, aren't able to take POs, stuff like that. Absolutely. That's well said. I've, I've, my one big mistake was doing a combined uh, thyroidectomy and a Whipple procedure. And that um, was the worst thing I ever have done. Uh, the absorption of calcium is terrible. So yeah, so these are all definitely considerations. I think in this situation with breast cancer and thyroid cancer, where there are two relatively limited operations, uh, I think, you know, maybe having a time cut off, like what Libby said, um, if the teams, you know, meaning the OR teams are able to, to jive and you can do it logistically. So it's probably reasonable, but understanding the pathology and understanding the tumor biology and, and kind of the overall big picture I think, uh, like Tracy said, is, is really important as well, because almost all these thyroid cancer things uh, can wait. It's really rare that you're going to be pushed into a situation where the thyroid cancer is going to take precedence. Any of the fellows have situations where you've done combined cases this year? I was going to say not combined cases, but we got asked several times this year to do them before um, consideration for transplant. Hmm. And because did you do it, We did. Almost mm -hmm. always. Well, because I mean, there were small thyroid cancers. We didn't think that it would have any impact. Um, but the, you know, a couple of patients were very, very sick. We had one guy in, go into VTAC in the room three times when we were just consulting him. Um, uh, yeah. His terrible. <laughs> and are these and liver, liver or kidney? Uh, no, these are actually, I was heart for one and then liver for two, I think, if I remember correctly. The thyroid case was interesting, though, because that was, um, he had, uh, amiodarone induced thyrotoxicosis that was also then he had a small PTC as well and so they that was kind of a little bit different so not a great example but the other two were very indolent small PTC and it was for uh, I think it was liver transplant for both of them if I remember correctly but they wanted the cancer out and done before yeah, yeah. yeah we need to perfect. change that I've been asked to do the same for heart transplant the person with a VAD for a follicular neoplasm, for God's sakes. <laughs> and what about uh, lap coli and lap adrenal? Have you ever been asked? No. I just I've did that. Dr. Shen and I, we just did that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I've done it. Uh, yeah. um, and that was, I mean, that was like right next to each other, you know, right-sided, right-sided. And it was, um, it was, uh, it, it worked out okay. I think we had to put an extra port for the, uh, the gallbladder part, but um, so the challenging thing is your ports are a little bit different, yeah, right? Yeah, we had to put a different port in, but it actually worked out okay. We did one with a, a small renal cell, but that was also turned into be an open case, so also not a great example. 
Our lab coli was for horrendous acute cholecystitis that they thought was red upper quadrant pain, but turns out to be his seven centimeter pheo. <laughs> poor, poor placement was not, oh my great, gosh. not great for either. We had to do a subtotal because it was so, because it had gone on for like six, seven weeks, but um, no, mm. I would have, it, hindsight, I would have left his gallbladder in place, just taken out his pheo, let him recovered and then done his gallbladder later. Great. Good learning experiences. Yep. Yep. Very good. All right. Cool. Um, I'm going to move on to the next case. All right, so another interpersonal thing. So now it's not an endocrinologist, but um, it's a salty other surgeon. So again, your first year, second year out of practice, in, into practice, and same thing, pretty straightforward case, right? Well localized right lower para, you counsel the patient, get them worked up, and then they decide, she decides to go get a second opinion from a senior general surgeon nearby who basically says, you know, I'm the big fish here. I do all these. I've been doing them for 30 years. This new young whippersnapper, you know, doesn't know what they're doing. Um, you know, uh, you should not have surgery with them. And the patient calls you very just upset, not knowing, like, you know, should I go with the fellowship trained young person who doesn't have as many cases under the belt or with this senior really, really, uh, you know, confident and, and established person nearby? How do you deal with this situation? Um, Libby, what, what do you do? So first of all, um, I would just say it's good general practice. Never, never try to convince someone to have surgery with you. M meaning don't ever say, oh no, this guy's wrong. You should go with me. I, personally, I've never done that. I've always just said, you need to do what you feel comfortable with. I am very comfortable with what I do, but you need to be comfortable. And most of the time, I will tell you, they, they will end up staying with you, but never, A, number one, think you're the only person that can do it, and I know none of you do, but B, never, <laughs> never have that, just don't think that, you know, I, I, I just think that um, it doesn't help you at all to, to put yourself in that position with patients. Yeah, Tracy, what do you think? Same. I mean, you know, don't bad mouth another person and just say, you know, this is, this is how I do it. This is how I learned to do it. This is what, you know, whatever, if you know your own outcome, that's great. And then just say, you have to do what you're comfortable with and the decision is entirely yours. Carmen, what do you think? Great, great points. Great points. Never make a patient, force a patient to do an operation, uh, um, never force the patient to come and, you know, convince them to do anything with you necessarily. Just say, this is what I do. You know, that's a great, you know, that's a great surgeon. Uh, they will do a great job. Um, uh, and uh, I, <laughs> I had a situation when I first came here, um, the family member of a, you know, a very famous music person came to see me and it was a straightforward case. And uh, uh, I guess somehow or another after, as, had a great experience with me, but somehow, I don't know, she ended up going with uh, having the surgery with one, another more established, fantastic surgeon. And I said, you are in great hands. It's going to be great. But I have to tell you, it, it hurt. It hurt me. It hurts. But you're never going to go wrong with um, saying, you know, I'm happy to take care of you, uh, in, but I'm also happy that you found somebody you feel more comfortable with. I think one of a common thing that you guys need to think about how you're, how you have the discussion about, and you've probably seen, you know, the, the attendees you work with this year, the faculty have this discussion is there's so much out there on all these diseases and people's different approaches and, um, you know, a gazillion ways you can do a parathyroidectomy and the, you know, how you do an adrenal or whatever it is, right? Um, and people will come to you and ask, well, I read that I can, that, you know, this is the way you should do it, or I saw this on the internet, or I saw that on the internet. And so developing a style that kind of explains what you're comfortable and how you approach an operation and why you feel comfortable doing that while not it, you know, being antagonistic towards anything that they may have read or, you know, heard about or whatever it is, I think is something um, that I still sometimes find challenging, right? But I think that's a, a, 
something that you're going to have to think about how you are personally going to um, answer with your patients. Yeah, uh, great advice. I mean, I'd say, you know, this is definitely going to happen to all of you um, because you'll be the new kid on the block. Um, and navigating it's, is not just the referring for providers, but it's also the competing providers. And um, it can be very challenging. Um, and the thing that Carmen said is absolutely true is you, it's hard not to take it personally, to feel that this is some kind of like, you know, character statement against yourself. And, it, it, and the only advice I can give you is try not to take it personally, right? It is not, you know, a measure of your value. It is not a measure of your worth as a person or as a surgeon, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I think it's very, um, hard to say, but you can, you know, but, but if you say um, it's, um, you have to be the bigger person and just, uh, you know, um, just say, it's fine. You do what is most comfortable for you. That person will take great care of you. Um, all that business. Um, early on in my practice, I had someone who, who um, went to the trouble of writing me this very long note about all the reasons she was not coming to me. And she was going with this more experienced, uh, surgeon, um, near, uh, more experienced, quote unquote, older, um, uh, surgeon nearby. And detail all these points, and I was like really ticked off. And I remember um, going to Dr. Dew, my mentor, and saying, you know, ah, you know, I can't believe that, blah, blah, all this stuff, and you know, wanting to like address because a lot of the points that she made were actually not quite accurate. All this stuff, and he's like, listen, when just like let it go, let it go. These patients will come to you eventually. You will, you know, develop that reputation and, and practice. It'll... And the other point is, he said. You know, someone who's doctor shopping and going to that much trouble and going through all those details may not be someone you want to take care of anyway, <laughs> because it's going to be hard to make them happy, right? It's going to be difficult to really, um, you know, yeah, meet their expectations, perhaps. And this may be a blessing in disguise. And so, you know, I've always taken that to heart. I mean, Dr. Dew is like, as you all know, the most like, you know, calm and Zen and, and wonderful person ever. And I'm certainly not of that temperament. And I've learned a lot from him in terms of like being able to say, you know what, it's okay, let it go. And, you know, now I'm in the situation, actually, there was a patient recently that was trying to doctor shop between myself and someone else more senior, uh, not senior, uh, you know, also very experienced nearby. And I was almost like, that guy's really awesome. You should really go there because this person was a little bit of a hassle. It was like emailing me all the time. And so you will get in that situation. I mean, it, the tables will turn at some point and, um, and that's okay. Um, so, you know, just have- What about, have you ever had one that goes, oh no, you know, they come and see you, you do all the work up and then they decide to go with somebody, whatever, somebody locally or whatever. And, uh, and then that person, fails and then they're back in your office have you yeah. had that before yeah yeah definitely and you just have to again be the you can say you know i wasn't present i don't know exactly what happened uh, i'm here to take care of what you have now and you know i think it's very challenging now we can get into some complicated medical legal stuff in the final times there are cases where it is out and right you know it's just basically i'm not gonna say malpractice but it's certainly not standard of care practice and when you see that happen um, and you're asked to kind of pick up the pieces, that can be very challenging how to navigate that. And I've had patients ask me like, should I sue my previous surgeon? I think that's a very, very tenuous situation. I'd like to get maybe some of your perspectives. Uh, Tracy or Libby, do you have thoughts on that type of situation? Yeah, um, you know, just as much as you're seeing someone's failure, someone's gonna see one of yours, right? Um, so you can read and usually just say, you know, I wasn't there. This is, you know, if you have the off note, this is what I understand happened and say, you know, op operations are challenging, just like when people, and this kind of gets to Kim as a question in about how you handle the question, how many have you done or how long have you been doing this? It's the same idea as if they say, well, have you ever had this complication? You know, yes. Right. Like, um, you have to be honest. You know, and again, knowing your own data it will go a long way, but you have to be honest and say, you know, complications happen to everybody who operates or, you know, I'm, I'm new, this is, you know, I'm, I'm just starting my practice, but I just completed a fellowship purely devoted to this, this type of operation and I'm fully board certified and, you know, I am comfortable with this and I have my partners, should I encounter something that I, un I don't expect and, I think they sometimes just want, most patients will just want honesty and you know that they can trust your opinion. 
rather than, you know, you have to be the most experienced person. Yeah, Libby, what are your thoughts? No, I, I would agree with that. I, I agree, you know, when patients come to you, especially after a complication or, or, or just their care and they're coming to you for, for care after it, it, it's such a vulnerable time for them. And, you know, I, I, I spend zero time on talking about the, the, what, what has happened to this point, except to say, you know, some of the challenges that can be part of it. But, you know, as I always say to them, these, this is the, the hand we've been dealt and this is the one we're gonna play and we're gonna do it together. And none of it, it, it's not about having them doubt themselves about what they've done up to this point or any of that. All, all they want is someone in their corner and that's you, right? And they're gonna know that and they're gonna see that. I, I agree, I mean, that's a great question to ask. What do you do when they ask you how many of these you've done? Well, you know, right, what you've done in fellowship and in residency. And, and don't forget that you guys have spent, you know, six to nine years, the last nine years doing this. You are prepared in, in so many ways. And so don't discount it. Never, um, you know, don't make false claims. I'm not saying that at all. Be very, very honest. But, but also you have had experience, um, but you can't, you know, you can't lie if they ask you, you know, how long have you been in practice? Just be very honest with them. And that may send them elsewhere and that's okay. It really is to everyone's point, it's okay. Um, because you eventually will have as much gray hair as the rest of us. And, and that will change over time. <laughs> you really will, I promise. So, so just, um, just know that, that, you know, I, it, it's it just be honest because that's the only way to be. That's the way y'all are. Well, great advice. Great advice. Now we're hitting up the end of the uh, 90 minute session. So I was going to wrap it there in terms of cases. I want to throw it out to the fellows. Any other questions, thoughts? Concerns, other things that are on your mind uh, while you, we've got our uh, awesome faculty and each other uh, here, because uh, you know this is our last ESU webinar sesh. Someone's got to have something. They don't have anything. They're ready. Yeah, they're completely ready. They're ready to go. Turn them loose. Um, we must take our silence for <laughs> confidence. Fine. It'll be fine. Oliver, are you about to say something? No, just thank you all for your time and imparting wisdom. This was really, really great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you guys. Yeah, the whole series has been really awesome. Whole yeah, and you'll have the opportunity to, to, I think some of you already did uh, submit awesome feedback for the regular ESU thing, but for the entire thing, I think we will send out another survey. And just, I mean, I made a lot of changes this year based on you know last year's uh, feedback. So certainly your, your words will be heard and we'll keep pushing this forward. Um, and I think, I don't think you've gotten certificates, all that stuff you will get at the completion of your fellowship, you will get an, you know, you'll say I'm a card carrying endocrine surgeon, you'll get a fellowship uh, certificate um, provided you've of course met all the standards of your particular program, et cetera, which um, I know you all did. Dr. Shen, I think you yep. promised us a get together at the 2020. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's on, it is. Both classes that got Zoomed for their ESU, uh, we will do something. So in Cleveland, uh, right. either Cleveland, here we come. <laughs> yep, and I have to say, um, also having been membership committee chair the past couple of years, uh, make sure to keep tabs of your cases that you do and keep the deadlines on the horizon for application for both ACS and AES, which will come about sooner than you think, two years after you get out. And so, uh, yes, Tracy. And make sure that AES has your new email address if you change it. Sure, sure. Oh, well, I mean, our AMR will bug you for that. But yeah, make sure you keep tabs and all that stuff and apply when you're eligible, because otherwise it gets kind of thrown in the waste heap and you're like, oh my gosh, it's here I am like several years out and I'm not, and we have to make sure to, to keep that, you know, that pipeline into the active membership um, active uh, for all of you all. Um, but we're at 5.30. Thank you all. Uh, it's been a wonderful year. Uh, I'm so glad. I, I really look forward to hanging with you all in person at some point at one of these meetings, but uh, thank you to our faculty for participating and, and bigger thanks. We mentioned Barb Miller a few times already tonight, uh, so we'll let her know that she, her words were uh, her teaching is still being passed along, but thank you to everyone for uh, participating in ESU and great, great job. It's exciting thank guys, you. congratulations. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much, goodbye. Thank you.